We're glad you're here. Open your Bibles to, Ro- to Proverbs 29. I'm s- <clears throat> I got some more father's stuff in me. I can't help it. Is that all right? Better be, because I tell you, um, it's all good, though, really. It's not just fathers. It's, it's um, <clears throat> you know what we have? We have a leadership crisis. Now, it's not just in the White House. It's not just in Richmond, but it's in homes and schools, school systems, principals, school board members. Yes, legislators. Yes, uh, you know, executive people in in, uh, political office, but also in businesses, also in homes, uh, among, among dads and mothers. We have a leadership crisis. And uh, and I like what Natalie said. You know, it's it it's not really a political problem; it's a spiritual one. And our answers come from the Lord. The Lord has the answers, and we're, we'll find them in His Holy Word. We'll find them. I mean, God has told us everything we really need to know about how to know Him and to live in this world and advance the kingdom and win souls. He really has. Everything, I, everything you and I need, everything you're looking for, everything you think you yeah, you know, and there's a lot of things you don't know and I don't know, but everything we need to know that God wants us to know, He'll reveal to us, and we'll find it right here in this blessed book. And His Holy Spirit, His blessed Holy Spirit, will lead us. He'll gift us. He'll uh, will bear. He'll show us things. He He will He will He will help us. He's our teacher, and He will show us everything we need. Proverbs 29, 2, the scripture says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Now that's true in government, that's true in business, and that's true in family. That's true. When 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 the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. And that, and that's absolutely the truth because that's God's word. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. And that is true, too. The leadership crisis that, that's so prevalent, and, and you don't have to look far. A lot of times, all the farther we have to look is in the mirror. And we can see there's a crisis. I mean, unlike anything I've ever experienced. Looking all around me, that you don't realize the phone calls we get and the people who come by and the things that people are, find themselves in, people who've worked all their lives and now all of a sudden, at no fault of their own, I mean, they worked hard, they faithful. Uh, I, I can think of a 61-year-old man who faithfully worked, worked for this company and helped build this company. I mean, worked for years. I, I, he might have been at the start of this company. Now, it's nobody anybody here knows, okay? But it's an it's a indigent family that I've been ministering to. So you don't know who I'm talking about. So don't hypothesize and try to figure it out because you do not know these people. I've only known them for about two months. But a 61-year-old man who worked for... 30 years, and helped, uh, you know, I was there to start and, and helped the owner. And, uh, you know, I mean, he was a faithful employee and worked and worked and worked and worked. And, uh, and, and you know, it, it, the, the fellow got, was success, successful and, you know, and, and fared well. And someone come along and wanted to buy his company. And, and he sold it for millions, a lot of money. And the, and the people who bought it said, now, if you'll invest so much, we'll match it, and we have a retirement plan, and we'll vest him. But the, the seller wouldn't do it. Can you imagine? And now this man has no job. No retirement. 
and can't get hired because he's 61 years old. Now, what, how do you, what do you say to people like that? You see, we have a crisis in leadership, in politics, in business, in our homes, and in our schools. What do, what do you say? I'll tell them, the Lord is faithful, and you keep your eyes on the Lord, and you do what? I mean, this man's mowing yards. This man is, I mean, he, he can, he's very, he can do a lot of stuff. And, and where he lived, way over yonder, way long ways from here, and he come over here looking for work. And usually, I mean, what he can do, you know, I mean, he can drive 18 wheelers and tankers and all kinds of, you know, and, of course, it's illegal to tell them, well, you're 61, we won't hire you. That's illegal. But you know and I know that it happens all the time. We have a crisis in leadership. We have a crisis in leadership in our homes, in business, in our schools, in our government, in our churches. We have a crisis in leadership. What? God tells us everything we need to know. He tells us everything we need to know. There's a character that God requires in leadership. And if you're a dad or you're a mom, if you're a husband or you're a wife, if you're an employee or an employer, if you're a teacher or a student, if you're a citizen, well, I'm a, you know, I think that's all of us, God requires us. There's some character. There's some things. That there's character that God requires. And the first thing that he requires, that people will rejoice. When, when, when you say, why, do you know so-and-so? They'll either rejoice or groan. I'm telling you, they'll either rejoice or groan. That's the way it works. Look, look what the Scripture says in, in Psalm 148, verses 11, 12, and 13. The Scripture says, Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and the heavens. What God, what God expects is godliness. And you don't curse God, you praise Him. You exalt Him. Just the other day, I had some fella was just, I was in a public situation. And uh, he was just taking the Lord's name in vain and just carrying on. And finally I said, sir, I, I want you to understand something. I know it's America and it's freedom of speech, but I'm a Christian and it offends me to think that you think God's last name is Dan. I wish you wouldn't talk that way. And you know what he did? He said he's sorry. He quit talking that way. You'd be surprised. If you'll stand for righteousness, we don't have to listen. Yeah, he might have gave me a five of clubs right across the lip. He could have. He could have. But he didn't. Do you understand? God expects godliness. Look at Romans 13, 4. The scripture says, For he is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. For these people who say, Oh, we shouldn't incarcerate criminals. We shouldn't. You know, it used to be pedophiles were put to death. I think if we go back to doing that, we'd see that fall real big time. Because God has raised up government to execute judgment against lawbreakers. If you're law-abiding, you have nothing to fear. Amen? God expects godliness because He is God. That's the character that God requires. Look at Proverbs 16. Uh, 12, the scripture says, it's an abomination for kings to commit wickedness, for a throne is established by righteousness. God says it's an abomination for anyone to lead a country 
and not lead it in a righteous way. Lies and deceits and double talk, these things are not from God and God will not bless. And in not only in a country, but any a school system, a, a business, uh, uh, anything, in your home, we've got to be honest. And we've got to be, we've got to be above board. Amen? Well, what does God, character of God require? He, godliness. He also requires wisdom. Look at Proverbs 8, verse 11 and following. The scripture says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. Counsel is mine. Sound wisdom. I am understanding and I have strength. By me kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles and all judges of the earth. You see, God will raise up a righteous ruler to bring blessing. But God will allow an evil ruler to come when judgment must fall. Oh, dear church, we've got, we've got, our ta- we've got work before us. And we've got a, a, a task before us. Second Chronicles 1, verses 7, 8, 9, and 10, 11 says... On that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said to God, You have shown great mercy to David my father and have made me king in his place. Now, O Lord God, let me promise, let your promise to David my father be established. And you have, uh, for you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this great people of yours? Then God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked for long life, but you but have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I've made you king. Wow. All I can say is wow. Now listen, when God gives you a blank check that he has signed, wow. What do you want, Solomon? What do you want? And oh, we see the, 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 the importance of wisdom. The importance of, of un- Lord, give me your discernment. Give me your wisdom. It, it's more precious than wealth or notoriety or prestige or, or reputation. You know, what other people might say. It, it, all, all the trophies, all the ribbons, all the awards, all the gold medals. Listen, wisdom is more valuable. That's what God places a premium on. That's what God requires. Listen, you want to lead your home? You want to lead your business? You want to, you want to be an example in your place of employment? You want to, you want to be a good citizen of this, this state and this nation? Then be godly and ask God and act in wisdom. You will be the best. Listen, the best parent is a wise parent. What other character does God require? Honesty. Proverbs 17, 7. The scripture says, Excellent speech is not becoming to a fool, much less lying lips to a prince. And then we see in Proverbs 20, 28, this verse. Mercy and truth preserve the king, and by loving kindness he upholds his throne. And then we see John 8, 44. But you are your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he's a liar and the father of it. Do you see the difference between the evil one and the holy one? And we as born-again people, we must align with the holy one, with our heavenly father, as revealed to us through his precious son, Jesus. 
who the Spirit of God lives within us. The character that God requires is godliness, is wisdom, is honesty, and it's also discrimination. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, the, the Scripture says in Proverbs 25, verses 4 and 5, it says this, Take away the dross from the silver, and it will go to the silversmith for jewelry. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. See the parallel? Oh, dear friend, the character that God wants in you and me, he wants us to discern what is dross and what is pure. What is, what, listen, the devil can pa package evil in so many ways. He can make it look good, smell good, be pretty, act pretty. Oh, just be exciting in every shape, form, or fashion. But I'm telling you, the peace of God passes all understanding. What the devil will try to appeal to you, he cannot appeal to you except through your senses. Through you, through, uh, you know, that's why it's sensual, you know, your senses. That's why he, he, he'll, 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 he, can't, he can't appeal to you like God can, like the Spirit of God can, who, who bears witness with your spirit. Well, what character does God require? In Proverbs 31, verses 1, 2, and 3, we see that God puts a premium on sexual purity. The Scripture says, the 31, yeah, the words of King Lemuel. Lemuel is a pet name that Bathsheba had for Solomon, okay? Uh, the words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him. What, my son, and what, son of my womb, and what, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. Now, now I, immediately, you know what, you know what you're going to think? Oh, I know about Bathsheba. Do you remember when? Isn't it wonderful that God can take failure, repented of, confess to him, repented of, and he can cover it, cleanse it, and remember it no more, and still take you. Listen, there, there, there's times that, that ladies, young ladies come and talk to me and, and Christy. Uh, I don't like to talk to young ladies a whole lot without her. It protects everybody. And, you know, and there, there's been a, more than a few times over the years that, that they've lamented that they've given away something that they were supposed to hold on to their wedding night. And I explain, I've explained before, I said, you know, if you will confess your sin to the Lord and stop that behavior, And he'll forget it, and you need to forget it. And see yourself as pure because he's made you pure. That's the way the Lord works. That's the way he works. But he, he knows our hearts. All friends. God puts a premium on, one, he puts a premium on that, on the, on the holiness of matrimony. I mean, it's why it's called holy matrimony. He puts a premium on that. And, and things that are reserved between a man and woman in matrimony is so special. And God, God will exalt that and bless that and make that. That is holy. Anything outside of that is unholy. Anything outside of that is unholy. And now we've got the devil telling, convinced a lot of people that everything, anything goes. Anything goes. Doesn't matter. Anything goes. But that's not what God's word says. And the character that God requires in leadership, lead your home, lead your business, lead your, 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 your uh, lead whatever it is that God, lead your, lead, lead wherever God has put you in leadership. You lead the kind of, the kind of character that he wants, that he, he demands of us. This is, you say, oh, this is just so negative, or this is so limiting. No, this is so protecting. This is protecting. And then in Proverbs 31, verses 4 and 5, uh, what character does God require? Sobriety. He says, 
It's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine, nor princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. I didn't write it, I just read it. God demands, God demands, listen, the, the, the farther up the leadership chain the Lord sends you, dad, mom, grandma, grandpa, employer, teacher, legislator, school board member, whatever, the farther up, the more responsibility he gets, the more you're going to have to be intoxicated by him and leave the world stuff alone. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You'll be a happier and a better person for it. What other character does God require? Well, he, he, he requires us to be protective. Proverbs 31, verses 5, 8, and 9 says, Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Verse 8, Open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. You see, we have an obligation to stand up for those who can't speak for themselves. That's why, that's why James tells us what pure religion is. Do you notice, usually when religion is referred to in the Scripture, it's in a negative way. But when they, when they try to make it a, in a positive way, they've got to put another adjective with it. Pure religion. You see? Pure religion. And that's the widows and the orphans. Those who, in other words, those people who can't help themselves, can't speak for themselves. They, they, they don't have, they're not a constituency. I mean, there's not, there's not this big union of orphans out there. You know, there's not this big association of widows out there. Do, do you understand? We, as the people of God, we have to speak for them. We have to be there for them. We have to help them. We have to encourage them. We have to make ways for them. That's the character God expects out of you and me. I know there's plenty of people out there make a they make a living holding their hand out. Let's learn to give them a hand up. The scripture also says in, in Psalm 94, verses 20 and 21, the scripture says, Shall the throne of iniquity which devises evil by law have fellowship with you? Speaking of the Lord, no, absolutely not. They gather together against the life of the righteous and condemn innocent blood. Sound familiar? Happens every day. We're approaching 60 million in America. 60 million innocent deaths by way of abortion. And you'll never hear anything about it on the news. So it, it, it's... it's but I tell you, God's taking note. It's making news in heaven every day. Every day. In Jeremiah 22, verses 2, 3, 4, and 5, the Scripture says this. And say, hear the word of the Lord, O King of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David, you and your servants and the people who enter these gates. Thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plunder out of the hand of the oppressor. Do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you indeed do this thing, then, sh uh, then shall enter the gates of this house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings who sit on the throne of David. For if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, it's the Lord talking, says the Lord, that this house shall become desolate. Somehow or another, we think in America we're invincible. Can I tell you we're not? We're absolutely not. We're not invincible. No nation on earth ever has been. Even Israel was removed for centuries. But to fulfill prophecy, God brought them back. And they're in the land. And I'm telling you, I want, I want to see America last until Jesus comes, don't you? I do. I want it to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. I want to see it 
where people can gather in the name of Jesus and speak of Jesus anywhere. They want to confine it just to the church house. They want to take it out of the public square. They've already taken it out of the school. They, they just want to limit it. But I'm telling you, we, we've got to have the character of God. And we've got to speak. We've got to tell people that there's a right way. There's a way that, that glorifies the Lord. There's a way that, 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 that exalts the Most High God, the Creator God. There's a way, and His way is righteous and right. It's not just any old way will do. Well, friends, what's the choice God respects? We can see the character He expects. I spent half the message on that. What choice? What choice does God respect? Hosea 8, 4 tells us this. They set up kings, but not by me. They made princes, but I did not acknowledge them. From their silver and gold, they made idols for themselves that they might be cut off. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people, listen, idolatry is as big in America as it is any nation on earth. Idolatry. People live for stuff, for things and activities that have nothing to do with exalting or glorifying God or helping their fellow man. We live for stuff. We live for things. We live for, for activities. I'm not against any of those things, but the key is, what's that key word? What, what's that M word? I think it's called moderation. Mm -hmm. But idolatry is prevalent. You know? <laughs> you know what I've been doing here lately? I've been watching soccer. I still don't get all I understand about it or know about it. I just, you know, it is the runningest. with no scoring. I mean, what I saw, I saw where one game ended zero zero, and everybody's excited. <laughs> but the only reason I've been watching, I've been watching the USA. You know, and I did watch Chile beat Spain because of Mike Sheffield. You know, he, he, uh, yeah, he's all excited, I'm sure. And, uh, and, you know, I, I'm more of a f American football kind of guy, you know, baseball kind of guy. And those things are, there's nothing wrong with those things. I mean, I played football growing up, played baseball growing up. I was wrestled in high school and. I mean, you know, I did, I did those things. But there's some folk who live, that's, you know, and they don't even play. They just live at Buffalo Wild Wings on the weekends and watch them all. I mean, and don't misunderstand me. I've God bless Buffalo Wild Wings now. I, they got pretty good wings. But, but you understand what I'm saying? People live for stuff and things and activities to, to a fault. And that's when they become their idol, you know. I mean, there's people who idolize automobiles. They, I mean, it's like, and I don't get it, but somehow it got them. Do you understand? Oh, friend, the choice that God respects. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 18, 19, 20, and 21. The Scripture says, and you will cry out in the day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Now, he's speaking to Israel about Saul. Okay? People, they didn't want, they didn't want to be ruled by the judges anymore. They didn't want to come under the authority of the judges and the prophets uh, solely. They wanted to have a king. Why? Because everyone else had one. You know. Oh, mommy, what can't, why can't I go down there by myself? So-and-so gets to. And, of course, you know what mommy would say. Well, if so-and-so jumped off a cliff, would you want to jump too? Remember? Oh, God says, you want a king. And you're going to cry out 
because of that king one day. Because God wasn't ready to give him the right king. David was the, the man. But he gave him Saul. Choices, the choices that God makes. You know what I've learned? I'm a whole lot better off when I have the peace of God in my choices. I have the peace from God, and I know, and I can, and it honors and comes in the, under the authority and compliance of His Holy Word. Too often we'll just make a decision based on our flesh. Well, I kind of, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I just love purple, you know, until they start putting the paint on the house, uh, you know, and they say, you know, I don't like purple as well as I thought. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? I said purple, not purple. I love purple. The consequences that God will reveal. Proverbs 29, 2, I read it to you to start. You'll cry out in the day because the king whom you've chosen. Oh, no, that's, that's the wrong verse. That's the one I just read. Oh, okay, no. Okay, go to verse 19 then. I've thrown you a curveball. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, we'll have a king over us. Verse 20. And they also be like all the nations, and the king may judge us and go out and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. Now, God, we don't care what you say. We know what we want. You ever been there and done that? Don't, don't live your life to please anybody but God. Please Him. And you know, if you'll please Him, those who love God will be happy for you. Those who, who love Him. Now the consequences that God reveals. Proverbs 29, 2, the Scripture says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. And when the wicked man rules, the people groan. Do you realize that when Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933, everybody was happy? Everybody was happy. I mean, everybody. The Jews were happy. Everyone was happy. They were just excited and just raw parades and rejoicing. And, and, and he, he started so nationalizing a lot of things. Free health care. You know, national, national health insurance. Oh, praise God. And he says, now, in order to cut down crime, nobody can have a gun. How do you convince, criminal, convince criminals not to have guns? You can only convince honest people not to have guns. So they, comp, they took all the guns. And, and then he says, this is, well, now... <clears throat> Uh, everybody has, and he started all these public works projects, built the Audubon. That's where we get our interstate system from. That's where Eisenhower came over here and said, you know, that, that was one thing that was good. Started putting all these people to work and working them and doing all these things and all these public works and, and, and raising everybody's taxes and, and, and you know, and, but providing a lot of stuff, taking more of your money, but providing a lot of stuff. And then when they started running out of money, guess what happened? Well, you know, Czechoslovakia has a lot of German people in it. And those Czechs have been treating them mean. So we're going to go in and take over. And the Prime Minister, Chamberlain, let him do it. And then he made a deal with Joseph Stalin and said... You know, uh, we want to take the eastern or the western half of Poland, and you can have the eastern half, and let's don't fight each other. And that's exactly what they did. And they started stealing these other countries and all their natural resources and all their industry, so they keep German people working. And then when he started building his army and building his army and building all these things, then he started enslaving the people that he conquered and forcing them to work. And then when things weren't working out, because socialism, national socialism never does, 
it's the Jews' fault. And so they started confiscating all their wealth and all their property and done all these things. That's what happened. That's what can happen and has always happened when an unrighteous ruler comes to power. Hitler's just one example. Just one. Just one. Napoleon was an evil ruler. Brilliant tactician. But he was evil. He was evil. Stalin, Mao Zedong, Ho Chi Minh. I mean, it just goes on and on. Pol Pot, and on and on and on and on and on and on and on. God tells us the consequences. God tells us the consequences. And yet people say, oh, God, we don't need you. And then when the Twin Towers come down, well, how could a loving God to let that happen? Wait a minute. You told God to get out in 63. He just stepped back and let you fend for yourself. How do you like it? I don't. Do you? I don't like it. I want you to see the control God reserves. Isaiah 40, verses 23 and 24, the scripture says, He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scar- scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall they, their stock take root in the earth when he will also blow on them and they will wither and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. Do you realize that God has that power right now? He could have consumed us. Along. When we started killing unborn babies legally, he could have done that to us right then and there. But he reserved his control. He's letting us have an opportunity to shine, to love people and to tell them the truth that, that Jesus died on the cross, shed his sinless blood, the virgin born more died and bore our sin that will set us free. But we have to stand up and speak up. We've been taking it long enough. We need to stand up and be counted. We need to stand up and make a difference in our community, in our neighborhood, in our schools, in our workplaces. We must. We must. Psalm 47, verse 7 and 8, the scripture says, For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. And I'll not argue with that. How about you? Uh, That's true. He's still in control, even though it seems like our nation's going to hell with a hammer down and no breaks to to be seen. Psalm 29, 10, the scripture says, The Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. You see, God destroyed the earth once by, by, by flood, by water. God, God allowed that to happen. God orchestrated that. God was in control, and he was still God. He was still God, and he still is. Psalm 33, verses 10, 11, and 12 says this. says, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. I'm amazed at how, how the leaders of the nations, the United Nations and, and the the European Union and, and, and NATO, America, and all our allies, and, oh, what are we going to do about... I mean, Iraq is disintegrated. It is, it is, you know, after how many years and how many billions of dollars and how many lives, and then just boom, it just, it, it just fell apart, just, just like President Bush said it would if it wasn't handled properly. Well, that's all I'm going to say about that. And now, Islamic jihadists are of the Sunni persuasion are rising up, and they, they control a third of Iraq now. And the Shias, the, another third, and the Kurds up north who aren't Arab, but they're Muslim, the other third. And, and what's going to happen? Iran is, is, is aligning with the Shia, and Saudi Arabia is aligning with the Sunni. So what, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? It's getting crazy. But I, can I tell you, God's still on the throne. And it doesn't matter how crazy things get. You keep your eyes on Jesus. And you follow him. You serve him. This word's still the final authority. 
You follow him, you serve him, and is it going to get harder? It probably is. I don't know how, don't know when. But until then, I'm going to enjoy what God has given me now. And when tomorrow comes, and if it gets harder, if things don't, I, I'm praying. I mean, this is the slowest recovery in the history of America since the Great Depression. So many people underemployed or unemployed. I want to see God break out. I want to see people. But you know what? I don't think it's going to happen until people start coming back to church, until people get their hearts right with God. And people on the outside aren't going to come to church till the people on the inside get their hearts right with God. Hmm. What's that next verse? I can't read it. Oh, yeah. The counsel of the Lord stands forever and the plans of his heart to all generations. Verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Isaiah 14, verses 26, 27 says, This is the purpose that that is purposed against the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched over the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and he and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will hold it back? Can I tell you? Nobody. Nobody. All friends. I you got loved ones? You got people who don't know Jesus? Get hot after him. Get hot after him. You, 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 got, you know people who are sick and infirm? Listen, let's pray for their healing. Let's use that as a flaming billboard. Look what my God can do. Your God can't do this, but my God can. All I can't do it, but the, the Lord God Almighty can. Come to his son and accept him. Be born again. Oh, I'm going to kick his bucket again. And then Proverbs 21 one says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water, and he turns it wherever he wishes. Would you pray for our president that this happen? Let's, we need to pray for him. I know we gripe and complain, and we're so disgusted and dissatisfied and so disappointed. You know, and I don't care if you voted for him or ever did vote for him, or you voted for him both times. We'll talk later. <laughs> but we need to, that Lord, turn his heart toward righteousness in you. Turn his heart. Turn his heart toward you. That would do our nation so much good. So much good. Well, what should we do? Well, it's in the book, 2, two Chronicles 7.14. says, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. You see, we, st we stumble over that H word. Humble. 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 It has the idea of bending your knee. Making yourself vulnerable. If we'll humble our, themselves and pray and seek my face and, and repent, Repent. Repent of your idols. Repent of your stubbornness. Repent of your pet peeves. R repent of your persnickiness. Persnickiness. I don't even know if there's such a word, but you know what I mean. Just repent of your wicked ways. Then I'll hear from heaven. God says, I will take note. Listen, I'm, I, I will hear you from heaven. I will hear and I will forgive your sin. And I'll heal your land. I'll heal your nation. Pray for a revival. Christy mentioned that Sunday night, uh, uh, <clears throat> Gerald Miller is going to be over to Agape. Gerald Miller used to be a correspondent, a newsman. I mean, he, he's got... And he's born again, spirit-filled man. And I'm, I'm telling you, he can, God is, 
God has his people everywhere. I'm telling you, you, you just go and I, just, just go tomorrow or Sunday night, at six o'clock over at Agape, and just let him minister the word. You, you're going to be amazed at. I'm, do you realize? I, I believe God still has people in the White House. I believe He does. I, I believe He still got them at, at, at in the Capitol and in the Supreme Court and on our school board and. Down at our state house in Richmond, I believe he has them. He has them where you work. He's got you, doesn't he? <laughs> there might be others, but we need to pray for a revival. We can make it with God. We can make a difference. We have a leadership crisis. We have a leadership crisis. It's in our homes and our businesses and our schools and in the political realm. What should we do? Well, we need to prepare. We need to prepare, and no matter what happens, whether, whether, whether evil abounds or righteousness abounds, whether, and if evil abounds, that means suffering. But I'm telling you, the Lord will sustain you and you will survive. Whatever comes, whatever comes. And then lastly, we need to prepare for his arrival. Because, dear friends, whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, I don't give a hoot. I'm, he's coming. He's coming. And I believe... He's at the door. And what we do, we need to do now. You say, well, I just don't see the urgency. Well, you've got a leadership crisis. You've got a leadership crisis. You've got one. And you wonder why this or why that or why this or why that or this or that. Go to, go to 2 Chronicles 7.14. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.